Brucham Aboyan, thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. The um, title tonight on my thoughts, <laughs> an interesting little title, How to Kill Your Wife. Of course, small print, with kindness. So let me begin my thought with a disclaimer. I am not a marriage counselor or a therapist. Okay, so the suggestions that I offer are based on my 52 years of marriage and experience that others have shared with me. As I always quote, good judgment comes from experience, and experience, well, comes from bad judgment. Newlyweds many times get married thinking that their marriage will be totally different than anyone else's. Better, of course. <laughs> well, welcome to the real world. Your first challenge as newlyweds will be the thermostat. You know, they tell a story of Rabbi Mordechai Anishkitz. He would travel from town to town to see what he could do to make the lives of the Jews better, both spiritually and materially. Once he came to a town and he went to see the local rabbi. He asked him about the welfare of the people and if there was anything that they needed. The rabbi told Rabbi Mordechai that the town no longer had a mikvah, a ritual bath. It seemed that there had been a pandemic in the town and the local authorities had padlocked the mikvah for health concerns. Well, Moshe the thief said eh, there was no problem. <laughs> he picked the lock and the populace was then able to use the mikvah again. When the authorities found out that the Jews were using the mikvah, well, they tore it down to the ground. So the rabbi told Reb Mordechai that they needed a mikvah. Reb Mordechai asked the rabbi if there were any rich residents in the town. The rabbi said that there was one such individual, but he was very stingy. And so Reb Mordechai told the rabbi to leave everything up to him. He said he would return in a week, and then he would deal with the situation. Well, a week later, Reb Mordechai returned to the town. He took up residence in one of the homes. As you can imagine, every Jew in the town came to get a blessing from the tzaddik. Everyone, that is, including the rich miser. Now, it took a couple of days, but sure enough, the rich miser came to see Reb Mordechai. He came into the room where Mordechai was staying, and he sat down, but he said nothing. And so Mordechai broke the ice, and he asked the rich miser if he needed a blessing for health. The miser said, no. Baruch Hashem, thank God, everything, every, everyone was healthy. Well, then for children, again, the rich miser said, no. Baruch Hashem, he had been blessed with children. Then wealth. Again, the rich miser shook his head and said that his business was doing well and that he was financially well off. With that, Mordecai turned to the miser and said, I, I don't understand. If that's the case, why did you come to see me? With a painful groan, the rich miser said, my wife is a shrew. I can't live with her. She makes my life a living hell. And Mordecai said then, try being nice to her. <laughs> the rich miser said, I've tried everything. Nothing seems to work. So Mordecai said to the miser, well, then divorce her. In certain situations, the Torah does allow for divorce. The miser said, you don't understand. I run her father's company. If I divorce her, well, I'll lose everything. So Mordecai looked at the miser and said, so why did you come here to see me? The rich miser looked down and mumbled that he wanted the tzaddik to pray that she dies. But Mordecai was stunned. <laughs> we get blessings, not curses. But with tears in his eyes, the miser said, but she's killing me. Her Mordecai thinks for a moment, and then a smile appears on his face. He says to the rich miser, I think I have a solution to your problem. The town needs a new mikvah built. Well, I suggest that you make a pledge, a vow, to build the new mikvah, and in addition, you, that you will pay for all expenses connected to maintaining it. What? <laughs> the miser couldn't believe it. The rabbi just told him. That's your solution? But Mordecai said, exactly. You see, our sages tell us that if a man makes a vow, a nedra, but does not fulfill his words, his punishment is that his wife will die. <laughs> the rich miser's eyes lit up. Really? The rabbi nodded his head. With those words of advice, the rich miser stood up, placed a large pouse of coin on the rabbi's desk, and he left with a big smile on his face. He was a happy man. He immediately informed the town fathers that he was making a vow. He was pledging to build and maintain a new mikvah for the town. As you can imagine, they 
were overjoyed. One week went by, two weeks went by, and still the rich miser hadn't given one ruble to the town fathers to begin the construction of the new mikvah. Every day the miser was monitoring the, wife, the health of his wife, the shrew. Not a cough, <laughs> not a sneeze. If anything, somehow she was actually looking stronger and healthier than she did before. He didn't know what to do, and so he traveled to go see Reb Mordechai. He told the tzaddik that somehow the advice was, he had given wasn't working. She was getting stronger, not weaker. So Reb Mordechai said to him, if that is the case, well, then you only have one other option. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning when she comes down for breakfast, Wait for her at the foot of the stairway with a cup of coffee. Greet her with, with a genuinely warm smile and say, Good morning, sweetheart. I thought you might like a fresh cup of coffee. The miser looked at the rabbi like he was crazy. He said, That won't work. I've tried so many times before. But Mordecai smiled at the miser and said, Well, just try. Try one more time. But you have to say the words from your heart with love and affection. So the miser went home and the next morning was at the foot of the stairs waiting for his wife to come down. When he saw her, he said, Good morning, sweetheart. I thought you might like a fresh cup of coffee. She froze. But then a smile appeared on her lips and she replied, Thank you so very much, dear. That was so very thoughtful of you. Well, well, from that moment on, they became like newlyweds. The miser couldn't have been happier. Life was good again, since he was no longer living with a shrew. Well, you guessed it. <laughs> Suddenly, she began to sneeze, and then came the cough. Two days later, she was bedridden. Doctors were called in, but somehow they just couldn't diagnose the cause of her illness. All that they were certain of was that she was not doing well, and that there was a good possibility that she could die. As you can imagine, the rich man was besides himself with worry. He hurried as fast as he could to Reb Mordechai again. He begged the rabbi to pray for his now dear and beloved wife. The rabbi looked at the rich miser and he said, The cure, my friend, is in your hands. I guess <laughs> that you will have to build the mikvah. There's a saying that men come from Mars and women come from Venus. I would have to answer amen, true to that statement. There can be little doubt that men and women are different, not only physically, but also in how they approach life. I heard a renowned family therapist say that it is the nature of men to think and then speak, and the nature of women to speak and then think. Well, good luck with that. What that really tells us husbands is learn to listen. People love when someone really listens to what they have to say. Don't talk, just listen. In fact, the word listen and the word silent have the exact same letters. Let her know you care. It's almost comical, but God has orchestrated the world in such a way that opposites attract. A personalities marry B personalities. That would be fine, but the reality is that bringing these two opposites together begins what many people refer to as the battle of the sexes. Each partner intent on helping the other partner in correcting the error of their ways, guiding their spouse, helping them adopt a much better path, becoming more like them. <laughs> it's like washing two fish in a tank. One fish is always chasing the other one. What is interesting, though, is that when the pursuer stops chasing the other fish, then the pursued turns around and becomes the pursuer. Bottom line, someone is always chasing someone else. So does this mean that we are doomed to spend our, li our ma whole married life fighting with each other about who is right? Or are we expected just accept everything that our spouse tells us in the name of shalom bias, peace in the house? Does it mean that the spouse that is the loudest and most aggressive always wins? Is that what God expects from us? Is that why God said that it's not good for man to live alone? Was it God's intention to create beings that would constantly fight with one another and then he would be entertained watching the action from heaven? Kind of the sitcom, all in the family. I think not. God is a benevolent father. 
He wants us to be the best that we can possibly be. A wife is referred to in the Torah as an Azer Kenegdo, as a helpmate opposite him. The only way that a spouse can be a helpmate to her husband is by being different. Everyone else in your family comes from the same roots. They are brought up in the, with the same parents, and they have all grown up under the same roof. Yes, there are still differences, but there are also many more similarities. Your spouse is the only stranger in your immediate family. They are the only family member that you have chosen. Everyone else was the luck of the draw, a gift from God, hopefully. But the fact that your spouse is different from all your other family members allows you the chance to grow, to see the world from a t totally different perspective. You know, you may not agree with your spouse, but at least you have heard another opinion. Before your spouse offered their opinion, you were sure that there was only one way to proceed, yours. What we see is that God, in his ultimate wisdom, has given us the opportunity to grow, to become better people than we were originally, to be neither an A or a B personality. Hopefully, we can grow into something much stronger and better, a blending of the best of both of you, the ultimate C. You know, I call marriage a masterpiece in progress. It's like a magnificent diamond, a piece of coal that did well under pressure. It will always be a diamond. But in order for its true beauty to shine, it must be polished constantly. There's a saying that I repeat often, happy wife, happy life. I think that one of the worst scenarios in life is to be in an unhappy relationship. There are few things in life worse than being alone with someone else. Marriage was meant to be a partnership, two people contributing their best assets and efforts to make the whole greater than its parts. There's a saying, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. I think that one of the problems in marriage is that we don't always treat each other with respect. If we are trying to sell something to a client or convince a friend to do something, before we would say anything, we would first think about what it is that we are about to say. After all, words can make or break the deal. You may have been nice to your spouse in the past, and they may not have responded the way you had hoped. Don't give up. Many marriages fail because each party is playing leapfrog. They try to make the relationship work, but then they give up. They don't feel that their spouse is reciprocating. But just like in the story, sometimes, one more effort, and everything changes. Remember that words from the heart go to the heart. Even though it is a woman who makes the home, a man can and should help to make the home comfortable for his family through his words and demeanor. His presence should bring a sense of peace and calm, not tension. You know, friends, in one of the seven blessings that we say for the bride and groom at the chuppah, at the wedding ceremony, we say, Samak to Samak, Re'em Ha'ohuvim. Grant abundant joy to those, these loving friends. One of the most important factors in, in a good marriage is friendship. You have chosen your spouse as your lifelong friend. Treat her that way. Our sages tell us in the Talmud and the Tractate of Yavamot that Ishto Kagufo Dummy, that a man's wife is like his own body. We need to treat our spouses even better than we treat our friends. And many times our expectations are just a bit too high. We think many times that they know or, or should know things about us. Always remember, men and women think differently. Be patient, be kind, and the odds are you will reap the benefits. Teamwork. You know, marriage by its very nature is a coming together of two opposites two opposite individuals to form a better whole. Try to be thoughtful. I always tell young men who are getting married, the Torah in the beginning of chapter 4 describes the relationship between Adam and Chava, the first married couple, with the words, Adam yada es Chava ishto. The man knew Chava, his wife. This is an allusion to physical intimacy. However, the verse is also telling a man to take a class, Study your wife. 
get to know her intimately. Anticipate her needs. Imagine what your home life would be like if you really know, knew pardon me, what your wife wanted and needed. What if you could fulfill her request, even before she asks? Study her moods and desires. You know, we all have things that trigger certain reactions. Know what sets her off. Know what makes her happy. Know what makes her sad. Know her. Compliment. Everyone. Everyone appreciates being complimented. I used to work out with a trainer. He would offer words of encouragement about my workout. I knew that he was only trying to motivate me, <laughs> but it worked. I would push myself just a little harder as he was talking. Words do make a difference. Tell her that she looks pretty. I often tell my wife when we attend an affair that I feel sorry for the other women in the room when you walk in. Make her feel special. Make sure to thank her for anything that she does. Take nothing for granted. Intimacy, well, is a topic that many of us find difficult and a bit uncomfortable to discuss. When my daughter was younger, if I wanted her to do something that she didn't want to do, <laughs> I would just start hugging and kissing my wife and immediately she would agree to my request with the words, I'll do it, I'll do it, please just stop. <laughs> so here's my thought on the topic of intimacy. As I've mentioned before in this thought, A's Mary B's, I think that this difference is also a factor in intimacy. By that I mean that one partner is usually more physically inclined, hotter than the other. I would guess that this, that is in case in most marriages, is that usually it's the man. But that is not always the case. Intimacy in a marriage can take on many guises. It's a mitzvah from the Torah. In fact, it was the first mitzvah first commandment given to mankind. However, that is probably not the first thought on most couples' minds. Since procreation is a necessity of life, God made it pleasurable. So more often than not, intimacy between a husband and wife is for pleasure. They share a moment of warmth and affection together. Somehow that intimate moment that they have shared may have the ability to help them forget the little concerns that arise during the day and replace them with the feeling of love and happiness. After all, you have just bonded in a way that only a husband and wife can do. Intimacy. Well, that sounds great, <laughs> but the reality is that intimacy is a major problem in many marriages. Instead of creating love and harmony, many times it creates feelings of anger, frustration, rejection. The list goes on. But why? Many times there are other factors that contribute to the problem. One, besides a low libido, I'm just not in the mood, or being overwhelmed with life, feeling tired, I just want to sleep, or just not feeling desired, since they do not feel like they are treated with affection out of the bedroom. Many times a simple word, a gesture, or, or a look is all that it takes to be intimate, a private moment that we can share, even in public. So let's look at some of these problems that interfere with the intimacy that a couple should share. To begin with, before we discuss intimacy, I think that one should concentrate on all the suggestions that I've made about growing your relationship. Think of it as a farmer. Before he can plant a crop, it, uh, there is a great deal of preparatory work that must be done, and so too with your wife and intimacy. Sometimes it's just a matter of helping her with her tasks running an errand, doing the dishes, helping the kids do their homework, or just putting them to bed. Whatever you do to help may free up some time so that the two of you can spend quality private time together. In reality, it's not a woman's body that you are seducing. It is her mind. Make her feel pretty. Compliment, compliment, compliment. Bring her home a single rose or just a candy bar. It may make her smile. Send her a text in the middle of the day. Let her know that you're thinking about her. Buy her a gift, something that she wants, not, not something that you think you would appreciate. Take the time to learn what she likes and dislikes. Get to know what she enjoys. Well, all of this is fine and dandy, but what if it just doesn't work? What if she says those famous words? I'm just not in the mood. What statement, that, pardon me, that statement? <laughs> has always amazed me. The beauty of being a woman is that you don't have to be in the mood to participate. 
With a man, of course, it's totally different. He has to be in the mood. In fact, that that is where all the problems come from. He, in many times, many times he is often in the mood, and she is not. What would happen if one of your wife's very close girlfriends would ask your wife to do her a favor, even if it was an imposition? If this friend was very close and they really had a need, I'm sure you that your wife would be more than happy to make her very good friend feel good. And if not, huh, then the guilt that she would feel by refusing her friend would force her to forget about herself and then help her friend. Following that reasoning, who is closer to a wife than her partner in life, her best friend, her other half? Yes, her husband. She may not be in the mood, and she might feel that if she were to give herself to her husband, that would be disingenuous. But why? He has a need that only she can fulfill. Any other action that he might take to relieve his need are all seen by the Torah as grievous sins. So that puts him somewhere between a rock and a hard place. The Talmud states that one of the responsibilities that a wife fulfills in their marriage is to keep her husband free from entertaining thoughts and actions that the Torah prohibits. How does she accomplish this? Well, by keeping his libido satisfied. I'm not suggesting that every time that a husband wants to be intimate, that his wife must agree. This is one of the scenarios where a marriage can grow through open communication and compromise. I repeat, communication and compromise. There are those that will say that if she is not in the mood, then the act is little more than sex. I totally disagree. I think that when a woman is intimate with her husband, when she is not in the mood, it's actually a greatest display of what we would call gemilat chasadim, an act of kindness. After all, if she is being intimate because she is in the mood, she is in reality satisfying herself, a somewhat selfish act. However, she is intimate with her husband when she is not in the mood, then that would be considered a true act of kindness to another person. Is there anyone that you would enjoy showing kindness to more than your other half? The one person in the world that you share your life with, your pain, your sorrows, your hopes, and your dreams. But like any other kindness that you perform, it must be done properly. So even if you are not in the mood, fake it until you make it. But always remember, you don't have to let your spouse know that you are doing him a big favor. Sexually, men are sprinters. Women are marathon runners. A husband should always keep that fact in mind and learn to be a patient lover. Who knows? Even though she's doing you a favor, it may turn out that she may actually enjoy herself. As a parting thought to my fellow married men, I always, rem always remember what Shlomo HaMela, King Solomon, said in Mishlei, Eishas Chayel Ateret Bala, a woman of valor is the crown of her husband. We get married to create a family and to build a beautiful life together with our chosen bride. Though God is the conductor of this world still, he has given us the opportunity to compose the melody, the notes that we will be played throughout our lives. But the melody is lifeless without the harmonies. Those harmonies are composed by our spouses, whose sweet music enhances the notes of our movement. Together, they create a symphony of harmony and joy. When the harmonies blend together, it's heaven. And when they clash, the sound is difficult to hear. However, when the melody and the harmony conflict with one another, we need to view it as an opportunity to create an even greater symphony than it was ever possible before. Bottom line, the life you save may be your own. The second temple was destroyed because of the sin of sin of skinum, baseless hatred. So let us work on changing baseless hatred into baseless love. The process has to begin at home with our spouses, and with that, may we herald in the coming of Mashiach Tzikainu quickly and in our time. Again, I want to thank you for listening. God should bless you. Your marriages and your relationships should be more than perfect. You should be happy, healthy, and safe. God bless. And again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for listening.